thank you very much. Uh, hi, my name is Manisha, and today I'll be talking to you about equivariance. Uh, don't worry if you haven't heard the term before or you're not completely familiar with it, I'll talk you through it. But what I want to do in this talk is show you how we use a simple observation of how convolutional neural networks work and why they're so applicable to image analysis and how we managed to use that and build a new type of convolutional, neural, uh, convolutional layer that is more data efficient and more effective for the problems we're working with. Um, at the end, this, this led to this new kind of convolutional layer that we call the group convolution, and we applied it to a medical problem, the problem of lung nodule detection. And the end result was that we actually only need one-tenth of the data that we needed in the original problem. And um, yeah, I'll show you how that's done. Uh, but before we go to that, um, I'll talk a little bit about convolutional neural networks. So this is my dog, Ender. Um, and it's a picture of a dog, and if you have enough training data and you train a neural network to recognize this, it's pretty easy to recognize that this is a dog. Um, and this is another picture of the same dog, and for us it's quite easy to recognize that it's, again, another dog. And for a, a convolutional neural network, that is also quite easy to recognize. Um, if you have enough labeled training data um, to detect a dog in the first place, it doesn't really particularly matter where the dog is in the image. It will still be able to pick it up and uh, give the same prediction, the same label to it. Um, we call this invariance, invariance to translation specifically, um, and it's one of the reasons why convolutional neural networks are so particularly suited for image analysis, because in images, uh, this happens a lot, that something is in one point in the image or in a different location, and it's quite nice that it's able to pick that up, um, and you don't need to augment the data set or anything like that. Um, and CNNs, convolutional neural networks, are invariant to translation, is what we say. However, if you rotate an image, if you have uh, a CNN that recognizes, if you have a model that recognizes dogs and you happen to rotate an image, and that that rotated version of the image was not in the original training data set, it's completely incomprehensible. Like this rotated picture of a dog is suddenly not a dog anymore. Um, and there are other types of transformations besides rotation, such as reflection or scaling and any types of others that CNNs are not invariant to. And the way we deal with this right now is normally data augmentation. We have one image in the training data set, so like the upper image, and we create various forms of that image, transformed forms of that image, reflect it, rotate it, um, we add noise, we scale it, um, and we add these to the training data set, and we basically train on these as well. We say these are examples of dogs as well. But what's interesting is we don't need to do this for translation, which is also a type of transformation. So why do we need to do this for, trans for rotation and reflection, but we don't need to do this for translation? The reason for this is specifically the way that the convolution operator works. So in a fully, fully connected net, each node in a layer is connected to each, next, each node in the next layer, and you basically have a lot of weights because each connection has its own weight. In a convolutional layer, however, um, each, it has associated filters, which are a small set of weights that are convolved over the input to produce output feature maps. The same filter, so the same set of weights, is used all over the image to produce various outputs. Um, and the value of a weight is therefore not tied to a single input, uh, but to multiple inputs. So we say that the weights are shared. Because we use the same set of weights in multiple locations, um, a shift in the input image basically results in that the feature is still picked up, but at a different point. Um, it results in a similar shift in the feature maps, basically. We call this equivariance, so equivariance to translation specifically. This is not the same as invariance, because equivariance means that if a transformation is applied to the input, a similar transformation is also applied to the output, and invariance means that a transformation that is applied to the input does not really influence the output result. It still produces the same output, so the same label. But the reason why equivariance in the convolutional layer leads to invariance in the convolutional neural network is because inside a convolutional neural network you have convolution layers, but you also typically have some form of dimensionality reduction. And the dimensionality reduction uh, basically reduces the spatial information, and by reducing the spatial information, the feature still picked up it in some way, 
and then the information is reduced, and then we still get the same label at the end. Uh, so, to summarize, the equivariant property of the convolutional layer itself, combined with the dimensionality reduction of the, um, uh, of the network, leads to translation invariance, uh, which means that a shift in input is simply disregarded and the image still produces the same output. So, this led us to the question, what if we could extend this, this, this weight sharing property that leads to equivariance to also be equivariant to other types of transformation? Could we, could we generalize the weight sharing property that leads to equivariance towards other types of transformations other than translation? Um, obviously, I wouldn't be standing here telling you all this if the answer is no. That would be quite anticlimactic. Um, so this is basically what we're focusing on. We're focusing on building in equivariance not only to translation, but also to rotations and reflections. And uh, for this particular project, we're focusing on lossless transformations. So that means, uh, for example, 90 degree rotations are lossless, while uh, if you do a 10 degree rotation, you, because you have to distort the image in some way, it is not completely lossless. And in particular, we're focusing on groups of transformations that together are basically close. So an example of a group is the group of 90 degree rotations. If you apply 90 degree rotations consecutively, you get back to the original image and you can basically combine 90 degree rotations to form other, all other rotations in the group. Like a 180 degree rotation is basically just two 90 degree rotations. Um, this group of transformations of 90 degree rotations has four elements, we say, because that's a closed group. You can see the image here, you see how these combine to form the, the same image again. Uh, but we can also have some bigger groups. For example, if you add reflection or the, the mirroring operation, you get a group of eight elements. And if you do this in 3D, I can tell you it gets a little bit more complicated even. Um, if we want to build in uh, equivariance to a group of transformations, there are basically two approaches you can take. One is to create rotated versions of the output feature maps, so the output of the convolution, and the other is to create rotated versions of basically what we use to produce the output, the filters. Um, Honestly, rotating feature maps is a little bit easier to implement, but it's also more costly, so that's why we're focusing on the latter. But both approaches are basically very usable and produce the same results. So the question is now, how do we use this and how do we build in equivariance? This is a quite a mathematical heavy story and I'm trying to keep the mass down to an absolute minimum on these slides. Um, but the very, very simple explanation of this is that we first create an augmented filter bank um, by transforming each filter by each transformation in the chosen group. So the group is, for example, the four 90 degree rotations. Then we have these, this augmented filter bank that's a little bit bigger than the original filter bank, like four times as big, for example. And we apply a regular convolution with the augmented filter bank instead of the original filters. So in other words, starting with a filter uh, with learning, le learnable parameters, we produce a number of transport copies of this learnable filter, which is not learned, but we use the same ways again, we just create a rotated version or a transformed version. And we use, we convolve those uh, to convolve and create output feature maps. Yeah. Um, the effect of this is that obviously we get more output feature maps, but some of these belong together basically. So uh, if you have one learnable filter and it has, it produces four orientation channels for the 90 degree rotations, which each pick up the same feature but in a different orientation. Um, we call these orientation channels because the various orientations of the same feature. Um, and the number of orientation channels we produce are dependent on the size of the group. So for 90 degree rotations, it would be four. For 90 degree rotations with reflections, it would be eight. It, it, you can get a lot of groups. Um, and this leads to equivariance. The reason that this leads to equivariance is that if you transform the input, like the input image that you, that you put in, it still uh, picks up the same features, but, and it's still, the, the orientation channels remain the same. So you still have the same orientation channels for this feature. It is just that these orientation channels are now shuffled, basically. So there is some kind of transformation applied to the orientation, to the output, but the 
it is still picked up and we still have the same information at the end. Um, this is how equivariance is preserved throughout. That is the gist of it. I would love to go into more detail about this, but it would be very mass heavy for a talk like this. Um, if you want to know more about this, please come find me. I'd love to talk to us about this subject, but I also recommend you read these papers. The first one uh, by Taco Cohen and Max Welling introduced the concept of group equivariant neural networks and proved their effectiveness in terms of data efficiency uh, on M rotated MNIST and C410. Um, then we Taco and me used this and extended it to the 3D version, so it was also usable for 3D convolutions, which made it applicable to medical data. And uh, we proved that it was actually way more efficient even in the 3D domain. And if you want to know even more maths about this, it's, there's a general theory of equivariance in CNNs that I can really recommend. There's also a lot of other uh, type of research done on this subject. Um, yeah, have a look at these papers, but um, for now, I want to be focusing on specifically the 3D case. Uh, the reason is that I am working on this and I'm actually using this in practice. Um, to implement the 3D case, it was a little bit more complicated than a 2D case because um, uh, rotations and reflections in 3D are a lot more complicated than they are in 2D. I, uh, at the top here, you see the 2D rotations. It's just four elements in this uh, of the square, but if you want to, if you take all the lossless transformations of a cube, you already have 24 different elements. And if you have reflection, if you add that to it, you get 48 elements. It gets quite complicated. And um, yeah, so, but the reason why we were doing this because, is because on the 2D case, it already proved that using the group equivariant uh, neural networks was data efficient. And in 3D, the using data augmentation is already a bit more complicated because you have so many options and also in uh, the medical domain where I work. Um, basically, a large, data, large data sets are pretty hard to come by. You need labeled annotations from experts, from doctors, and honestly, that's just, you, you often run into the problem that you don't have enough data. So we were really interested to see if we could use this to apply to medical image data. Um, the problem we specifically tackled was that of pulmonary nodule detection. Pulmonary nodules, or lung nodules as we call them, are suspect lesions in the lung visible on a CT scan. Um, they may be malignant, they may not be malignant, but they're basically early signs of lung cancer. So they're pretty um, relevant to detect, but also pretty hard to detect. On the top here you see a single slice of a CT scan of the chest. And the thing that's, uh, I don't know if you can see it on the slide, but the thing in the top, that is one of the things we need to detect, but it's a black and white image. It's quite difficult to find. Um, and typically we have about 300 of these images to form a full 3D volume. Um, if you want to detect nodules, because you have uh, 300 images that are basically 500 by 500 pixels, it is quite difficult to just throw it into a scene in one go. So we first do Canada generation, we analyze the whole volume for suspect lesions, anything that might be a little bit odd, and then we do a kind of a classification of non-nodule versus nodule on all the candidates that reduces the amount of false positives that we have. Um, and also one of the reasons why we chose this particular application, besides that it's of course very relevant to detect lung cancer in an early stage, is also because we have a large training data set available, which is pretty rare in the medical domain. Um, this large training data set comes from the National Lung Screening Trial in the US. And we also have a high quality test set available from the LIDC. Um, and this test set is basically annotated by four different expert radiologists, so we're pretty sure that the quality is good. Um, so this enabled us to test whether our group convolutions actually were uh, were effective on this uh, domain. Um, yeah, so we wanted to evaluate whether our CNNs with their improved equivariance actually performed better than a regular CNN. Um, and a way to do this was first to train a baseline CNN, just a, a regular neural, normal neural network, and make sure that it's competitive with the Luna 16 Grand Challenge. The Luna 16 Grand Challenge is a challenge posed by Radboud University, which is basically the lung nodule detection challenge. And uh, we trained a neural network that got a top 10 performance, so it was like pr pretty decent, pretty good. And then we simply 
uh, replaced every convolution in the CNN that we ba trained, the baseline CNN, and replaced it with one of our own convolutions, so the group convolutions. Um, we still use the same training, validation, and test data set. That didn't change. We also use the same architecture besides, you know, the difference between normal convolutions and group convolutions and hyperparameters. We still use data augmentation. I think this is very important to notice. Obviously, there are other types of transformations that these networks are not invariant or equivariant against. And we still use rotation for, you know, the 10 degree rotations that we talked about. Um, we use exactly the same data augmentation scheme. And we use the same number of parameters. Um, and because our interests specifically lie in finding out if this is actually more data efficient or not, which means we use less, more or less training data, uh, training data, we train this on uh, four different training set data set sizes. So obviously the, the baseline was trained on the largest training data set size. We use that same baseline um, and we use the group convolutions for 30 samples, 300 samples, 3,000 samples, and 30,000 samples. Um, and we were interested uh, to see if we saw a pattern in the results. We did. Um, so these are the results of our, uh, of our baseline versus the results of our uh, group convolutional neural network. Uh, the scores are uh, calculated by having a sort of a trade-off between sensitivity and false positive rate. It's the same way as the Luna Grand Challenge calculates your overall system score. Um, and we noticed that for the biggest available data set size of 30,000 samples, our CNN, uh, or so the GCNN, already performs a little bit better than the baseline, which is, which is pretty nice, because in this region, like, the, the scores are all pretty close, and it got us from a top 10 performance to a top 3 performance, I think. Um, but what I thought was way more interesting is that the smaller the data set uh, the training data set gets, so to 3,300 and even 30, the more pronounced difference between the performance of the GCNN versus the baseline gets. And if you take a close look at this particular bar chart, you notice that for every GCNN that is trained, it performs better or roughly equal to a normal baseline CNN trained on 10 times as much data. So, for example, I think that's clearest on the 30 versus 300 uh, example, but it, it goes for every every result that we got. So for our particular application, the GCNM was roughly as good as the baseline trend on 10 times amount, the amount of data. Um, for someone like me who works in the uh, medical domain where large data sets are scarce, data efficiency is absolutely essential. And um, by observing why CNNs are so efficient and useful for image analysis in the first place, We've managed to extend this in a way that reduced the data requirements by tenfold. And I can also tell you, we already also applied this to a couple of other related problems, and we saw the same trends. And something I didn't mention in the slides, but is also very interesting to mention, is that um, specifically for lung nodule detection, like I said, not all lung nodules are malignant. But we showed an extreme, extreme more sensitivity to malignant nodules versus benign nodules, which is also very interesting because that is something we didn't even train on. Um, yeah, so GCNs, as far as we've seen, are way more data efficient in both 2D and 3D. And group convolutions are extremely easy to use. We have a package that's available. It's available in, uh, for Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and even Chainer, if that's your preferred framework, which I don't know. Um, and you can just use the group convolutions as a drop, as a drop-in replacement for your normal convolutions and keep everything else the same. And for us, that has proved very beneficial. So I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing other people use it as well. I, if you have any questions, if you want to try this out, if you have any other ideas, please contact me. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marija, for your talk. Uh, now we have some time for any questions. Anybody have any questions? <clears throat> Hello. Do we know why uh, the human brain actually doesn't have any problems with uh, this invariance? And, uh, because we can just tilt our head and then we, we don't have any recognition problems. What are we doing differently? 
Well, I'm, <laughs> I don't think I'm the right person to tell you this. I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm just a data scientist. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just that for us, it obviously it becomes a little bit, I, you also see it with the, the rotated image of the dog. It's a little bit more difficult, but for us, it's still quite easy to see. And yeah, I don't know why, but, um, you can't do it upside down. That is true. We can do it, though. Hi. Uh, thanks for the excellent talk, um, and thanks for your project. Um, I'm wondering how this would relate to data augmentation. If you would simply do the same operations um, augmented, wouldn't it be the same efficiency data-wise, but just slower to train in the end? Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a good question. Um, one of the experiments that we did was uh, perform uh, all the augmentations that we uh, try to be equivariant towards at test time. So basically averaging predictions over various... Uh, um, so you have, the, you have the test image, you perform all the augmentation, you create all the various predictions based on the, on the transformations applied to it, then average. That did lead to an increase in score compared to the normal baseline result. But still, uh, our GCNs were a lot better than using that. So maybe this question would actually be better with if you had an image, but did you examine the kinds of filters that uh, these uh, group convolution layers actually produce when trained? No, that is actually something um, I got asked before, and that was something that we wanted to do, but there's uh, there's so much research still left to do on this subject. There's also some uh, follow-up research that's being done right now. Uh, we haven't really had the time to it, but it is something that's interesting, and we wanted to take a look at. We just didn't get around to it yet. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, too. Um, for the great talk, uh, how does it relate to capsule nets? I think they wanted to achieve the train. Uh, yeah, that is the uh, same thing. Yeah, true. Um, I don't know much about capsule nets. I do know that that is actually one of the um, the same ideas that they have that you build in some priors basically beforehand. Um, we haven't compared them, if that's your question, um, but it would be. I think the same reason why capsule nets were uh, are sometimes a good choice is the same for this because they do the same thing. And maybe one quick follow-up. Um, did you also see some improvement in training times? Sorry? Did you see reduced training times? Um, that is also an interesting question because it is, because we do re create, uh, rotated versions of the filter and we have to compile with this. This actually leads to a, an increase in training time. But one of the things we notice is that GCNNs have a trend to converge much faster. So while each epoch takes a little bit longer to train, you need to train way less for, for, uh, smaller amount of time. Other questions? Hi. I was wondering, um, have you also explored other, other kinds of transformations? So, for example, scaling, I could imagine the same. And can they be combined, uh, combined into one group convolution layer? That is, a, that is also a very interesting question. Um, not me personally, but I do know that there is a lot of research being done into equivariance and invariance, especially equivariance right now, and scaling is one of the interesting research areas. So there are others that have attempted this and do a kind of a similar thing to achieve equivariance to scaling. I have a question. Uh, the data sets that you mentioned, uh, are those open and accessible to people not at our university? Uh, yeah, so I use two data sets. The first is the National Lung Screening Trial, and the second is the LIDC uh, injury database. The second one, the test set, is uh, available on the Grand Challenge website that I mentioned. It's just it's an open Grand Challenge. You can just um, download the data uh, immediately. And the C is semi-public. Semi um, you can get the data, but you have to submit a proposal about what you want to do with the data, and then you get it. And one more uh, for people that are interested in pursuing vision um, neural networks. Is there a resource that you think is um, most important while also being uh, accessible that people could uh, look into? Just to get into... Uh, convolutional neural networks and training it on um, uh, 
vision or data, like what you find? I think there are a lot of resources available online. There are a lot of courses available online. What I really want to want to tell people is don't just do it. Don't just implement a network like an example that you see. Try to understand why the different layers work the way they do. Try to understand what's actually happening. Because for me personally, when I first got into image analysis and vision, I didn't actually realize what convolutions were, how they worked, why this was better for image analysis. I just accepted that it was better than a fully connected net, for example. Um, try to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, thank you for the great job. And if this uh, group convolution layers could have an inverse transformation for the generative models, like convolution transpose, upscaling. Or... Uh, so, sorry, can you repeat the question? So if this uh, uh, group convolution uh, nodes could have an inverse transformation for upscaling yeah. in order to build some generative models. Um, we, we haven't worked with that yet, but I imagine you can extend it to do that, yes. I see that there are no more questions. Thank you very much for your talk.